All right, so next up on the agenda is a discussion led by um, Amy and Penny on two things, um, PowerPoint hacks and mapping hacks, the quick map. So I believe, uh, Amy, are you going first? Yes. Okay. I believe so. Um, so I'll share my screen and get going, but um, kind of as a background to this, our office, Office of Rural Health in Montana, um, we've attended the last three data summits. And after the last one, Natalie and I, and all the talks of Anne K. Emery and the data visualization, um, Natalie and I decided we wanted to spend this a good chunk of um, time actually looking at all of our data. And we actually went with a specialist who Anne K. Emery recommended to go over all of our graphs and talk about what a good graph looks like and what are those elements with our data specifically. So I thought I would share with you the infographic she created for us and then um, walking you through the elements of it and how to edit any things and then if you guys have questions about how to hack PowerPoint as we go through um, we can do that so I'll just I'll open it up I'll share my screen um, I'll, I'll, I'll zoom out a little just at first so you can see what it looks like uh, but these are the infographics we create based on, it's a two page front and back for um, community health needs assessments per community. So we take the survey findings and we just put it on two pages. Um, so this would work really well, these infographics for a quick handout fast facts page. Um, so I'll go through some, some of the elements that we were taught were a good infographic. So lots of white space um, using a similar color scheme. So keeping just three to four colors and being consistent across the entire document, always using those colors. And if you recall um, from, I believe it was two years ago, Anne K. Emery walked through how to create um, color themes. So when you actually go to um, these design themes, you can create your own. Um, so let's go to, oh, now I can't remember how to do it. <laughs> so we actually have all these colors saved into a theme. So when you automatically are in that theme that you've created, they'll, it is, that way you won't have to keep looking for them. But I can show you hacks too, so you can save the colors. Um, so some things that have helped with, um, with the, the infographic tips is um, that humans like grids. So I've included some elements here, um, alignment things. So we'll go over some of these and then sele um, selection tips as well. So um, maybe I'll just do a brief overview. So we just do an overview of the assessment process of so the Barrett Hospital and Healthcare and the County Health Department did a joint assessment. We just give a little overview and then you can click on this cute icon to lead to the entire report. And then we just go over the top threes of some of the survey questions we asked. So top three suggestions to improve access for healthy community. And then you can add these little graphs and they're super easy to do. I'll show you guys how to make them within PowerPoint if you'd like. And one of the biggest hacks that I've seen is to actually make a graph look good and visually appealing is to not rely on the automatic logos and data labels that are provided to you by Excel or PowerPoint. So you actually add the labels yourself in a text box so it looks like it's all part of the graph, but then you can add these as well. So we've done that with the majority of our graphs is removing the labels that are automatic because they usually don't fit well. They like go in weird spots and you can't really move them around. So you create your graph separately and then you get rid of all data labels and you just create them your own and then you can add them and group them together and move them as a unit. And pair with these little icons, which I know we talked about in one of the sessions with um, Ann K. or Marie last go around. Um, one thing I did like about e the person we went through, Echo Riviera was her name. Uh, she doesn't emphasize using a lot of crazy graphs, like is the simpler the better, just use nice colors and keep them consistent and then icons. So we really just use these simple bar graphs to show um, data and then these um, nice stacked horizontal, they're called the stacked and then again, because it doesn't look good to add those automatic labels, you just add them yourself below. 
And then we have these waffle charts here and I can show you how to edit those below and I can even share a waffle chart. I know we got a waffle chart template two years ago, but I can reshare a template with everybody if they would like a waffle chart. <clears throat> So some cool, and then so here's the back side too. We've got more waffle, and it's broken into these components here. And so the the idea of the grid thing is um, you want things to be sectioned off. Our eyes like to look at things in four quadrants, and so a good rule of thumb when creating these is you can go to um, view, and you're going to add your guides, and it will pop in a little um, imaginary line there in the middle and so as you're editing you can just look if you go out to 100 percent, it puts it automatically in the middle and so you in general want to keep your 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 quadrants equal with the amount of text the amount of things in that item it makes it easier to look at and then also keeping in a lot of white space as well <clears throat> and so one thing i've learned that has been really really helpful in um, having this template um, which I think will make it, if I ever create a, I mean, whenever I create a new one, it's, I have all these tips and tricks now just from having this nice one that was created by a professional. Um, so I'll show you some of those that I've learned is that you can turn on these guide systems that make it super easy to drag things around. So you can see if you're lining up with other items in your list here. So you can see now that's aligned. I didn't know how to do that before this. So I'll show you how to turn that on. Um, when you're on the view section, here, there's the guides, grid lines, ruler. This is where you add your royal ruler. You can add, um, it's called smart guides, and that's just making sure everything's aligning and it will automatically do that. You can also, um, if you've ever had issues where something is behind something, you can't grab it, it's like the boxes are on top of each other and it's impossible to grab. One hack is to run your lines across all the way to the end. So you can see this box goes all the way to end. So if I wanted to grab this text box and not the text, it's really easy to grab it because it's leaning over the side. Same thing with these um, lines on the side as well is if you wanna be, if it doesn't, um, when you print them or put them into a PDF, it won't matter, it will cut off those margins, but you can grab them easier if you can see them on the sides. <clears throat> Another hack too would be, um, oops, when it does that, I can't see. When you're on something like design format. Okay, when you're on the align tool, um, this has been a best friend as far as if you want to make sure that all these boxes are aligned, you could eyeball it. Um, it especially helps with the smart grids, right? It will say if they're all in the line together. Or you could grab all of these by pressing shift and do the align tool. You can do a right clip. a line here, it's under format and arrange. And then you can align everything in the left, you can align it in the center. So this is a, a good tool to have. So instead of eyeballing things. There's one more thing I was gonna show up here. Oh, the selection. So when you're um, having trouble finding all of your um, boxes, you can go to the home tab, click arrange, and then click the selection pane. This shows you all the individual pieces of the slide. I did this before, so. Oh no, I can't find it. There we go. So here. Um, so this is all grouped together, so it can be hard to grab the individual pieces, especially if things are overlapping with each other. <clears throat> so if you click on the home tab and then there's this arrange function here, you can go to the selection pane and it will bring every single element that's on your page and you can grab things individually. So I've had that problem before where it's lost behind something and 
um, you don't want to move the thing because you just took forever to put it exactly where you want it. So you can actually find that element. Um, it will bring you through each graphic text box and then all these little rectangles from the waffle chart below. So there's a hundred of those, right? A hundred of these little rectangles. <laughs> And then I'll walk you through how I change our waffle chart here. So this is the waffle chart template and I can send this out to anybody afterwards. Um, I've had trouble before with waffle charts where you try to move them and then you ended up messing up the entire template. And so um, I didn't realize that you could actually just ungroup everything from a waffle chart. So you can ungroup the items and it will show you the big old, you know, it will select everything individually. Um, you can actually, if you press shift and you can select all the ones you want to change colors of, so you don't have to do it individually and you'll change the fill color to whichever one you want to use. You can go to your recent colors, your template colors. So if we wanted to change all those to red and we had, you know, 90%. And then at the end, when you're done selecting, you'll group them back together. So they're all selected now and you can right click and group them back in one and then copy and paste. <clears throat> what I've done for this infographic, because I don't wanna move around these boxes that I've like tediously arranged and put them exactly in order, is instead, and so and since it's really hard to change squares that are so tiny, is I'll just change the size of this from 0.87 to let's say uh, two, and I'll just blow it up. And then now it's much easier to edit, but I'm not gonna move where it lives on this page. And then once I'm done changing my squares, putting, you know, changing it from 20% to 15, um, then I would bring it back to that 0 0.87, 0 0.87, and it, it didn't move, it didn't wiggle, it didn't change it all around. Um, I can go into specifically how to make a graph in here if you guys want to see that, if anyone's never tried that function before. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, I hadn't realized before that the functionality with an, um, uh, PowerPoint is essentially the same as Excel. You could create all the graphs in Excel beforehand, or you could just go um, create them as you go. Um, so if you wanted to insert a, let's see, let's try like this stacked bar. Um, you could just say insert and you could make a chart and you'll have all these options here. Um, I have them saved as templates. So um, once something is created and you like the look of this chart per se here, I would save it um, as a template here. So I've got all these templates saved. So one year stacked horizontal, one year bar chart. And then next time you have it, it's actually in your, your saved charts. Um, so I'm gonna insert a template and I have this one year stacked horizontal in here again I got kicked out of PowerPoint so it closed out where I was. So as you're doing that one of my questions is uh, just a, a step back from this um, why you choose PowerPoint here I think I know why but I'd love to hear from you why you choose PowerPoint here versus Word or something else. Um, so with PowerPoint, you have, you can add the charts within the document and it's also much easier to drag things around in PowerPoint. You can put things anywhere. Whereas you guys have seen in Word, anytime you want to drag something around, you have to address the wrapping of text. Um, you'll have issues with things getting moved around and locking to a page or linking to another thing. So with PowerPoint, everything lives within its own little text box. You can drag things around however you need it. Um, and simply, we just change the orientation from, you know, you generally get a horizontal page, you bring it to vertical, and then you can just start adding those elements one by one. Um, but with the 
so the nice thing, I mean, you, I, I think may, you might be able to do it in Word now too, is insert those charts directly, but I really like the ability to not have to go back and forth in Excel. Um, so if I wanted to insert a chart, it's got that same functionality that Excel has when you're making one. So here, if I wanted to add a bar chart, I could add it. Um, here's a nice thing about bar charts. So I just created a random bar chart. It's gonna, it's gonna fill in all these pieces, right? from until I edit them. Category one, two, three, four. We'll just move it to the side so you can see it a little better. Um, if I wanted to make this match the formatting that I have here, I don't have to do all this stuff to, you know, edit it back and forth. I could just press copy and I can paste um, the formatting to here. So I would go, I think I can do it on home, paste, paste special, and you would do formats. Picture format. I don't know if I can do this in, um, okay, this might be an Excel hack. I'm not sure if you can do this in a PowerPoint, but I can copy this one generally and then Okay, that only works in Excel. So if I wanted to um, paste this formatting on another graph and I had one that was already perfect, I could copy this and then go to paste special, paste format. So that is, I guess, is, I suppose a downside. <laughs> um, so what I would typically do then is if, because I already have my templates saved and like the way I want them. So you could edit this to how you want it to look. So I would change my categories. I would make these colors match the ones I want. But the way that I would make this chart exactly how I wanted in this Excel or this uh, PowerPoint is I'm going to just delete all the um, the chart title I'm going to delete. I'm also going to delete grid lines. I'll delete the legend and I would delete the t um, the access as well. So now you have a really simple looking um, graph. And you put it where you want it to go. You would match your colors. And then I would add my labels by myself and add them. That way you can make them. So the, the problem is with um, X, so the graph ones that you can't change different colors. It all has to be one color. So I would just copy these labels here. I'd place them next to this graph. Oops, it's hard. I should have like white space. I should be doing this on. It would be much easier instead of the side. Let me do that. Amy, maybe insert a new slide and put your graph there. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Add a new slide. Okay. It doesn't work to create it on the side. Well, that came down. I can't grab it. I think because this thing's open, it's acting really. Okay, so I would add my own labels. I would add a little, um, I would make this longer, probably copy another text box because I have four categories here, right? So add another one. And then instead of, um, I would ungroup this as well. And then you're gonna match these to each one after you get your data selected. And then you could insert those, um, those icons as well. Does everybody know where icons live? I'll show you where they, you can find them. So it's just under insert, it's this little duck shape. So if I wanted to find one for alcohol use, um, you can go through, there's lots of categories. Um, the only, oh, you can search now, so that's nice. 
to keep it body parts, bugs. I can't remember what you usually use for alcohol use. I think the cricket is the universal icon for alcohol use. Beer stein. Okay. The beer stein. <laughs> I can't find a stein. That's okay. I'll put a little soccer ball. How about that? Because I've had difficulties with those icons, what version of PowerPoint are you working in? Oh, I'm not sure. Um, I believe it's Microsoft 365 or Office, excuse me, Office 365. So it's yeah. the latest version of PowerPoint is. It's not available in older versions. It says this is version 2000. Maybe this is, I'm sure I have at least 2010. I, I do the updates regularly. Um, yeah, I don't believe, I think you do have to do the updates, so it doesn't live there unless you do them. And even um, Excel now has the updated version. <clears throat> I would match my um, label here with the label of this, like, and the color of the soccer ball. So I'm going to make it a good size. And then you can just change the fill color to match. And then you can use that um, align. The only problem with the align function is if your square is not, um, it'll take into account the entire size of the square. So you want to make it scrunched up around the words or else if you have a giant square, it's going to align the whole square. Um, so I'm just going to select with my guides, I can see pretty well that this is aligned, right? Or alternatively, I could select these two elements and then go to um, right click Oh, I always forget how to do the line. So I go to um, format and then go to align and then you could align um, middle. That's how I would do that. And then to take all these ones, I would align them probably in the middle center. See, but it kind of it messes them up if they're not all the same size. So that's why you have to make those correct. Um, and then you could add data labels here. That's maybe the one thing I would keep is the data labels on the side um, and making them like a nice, big, bold color. Um, and then one thing I've learned too is with the, uh, is matching all your labels across the board. So for this data set, I would, if I wanted to select my data and edit it, I would edit data. I like to do it in Excel. So it just pops open this little Excel sheet for you. Um, let's just work with one series for now. Make it easy. So category one, two, three, four, these are our numbers. So it's gonna pop them up like this. I would match this row with this soccer ball color. So you're gonna change the fill of that one to match. And then you're gonna add a data label like that. And you can change the individual one to match as well. So if you just, if you click on, once you click on these labels, it selects them all. If you double click, it will just give you this one and you can select. And at that point, I would make this bold, bigger, and the same color. Oh, it didn't do it. I think I have to select it. and blue. So then you would do that for each one of these is come up with a, a label, an icon, and then make all these the same size and match the color graph with the side as well. So those are kind of like the, that, I mean, you can't, it, it, uh, Excel's not going to make a really pretty graph for you. So you really have to like manipulate the labels you add on your little icons. And then you just change each of these items to match how you want it to go. Um, and then once I would have this exactly how I wanted it, I would save it as a template. And so next time, if I wanted to create something um, like one of these items here, I would like if I wanted to change this over because I have it a template now, I could just put change type chart, chart type. This is a clustered bar. I'd go to my templates and I could change it to a stacked one really easily. 
um, by selecting this one. Uh-oh, it's going to die again. Oh, no. Cute puppy, though. Thanks. <laughs> They're being good and quiet today. Um, so that's like the, big, the biggest time saver is once you have exactly the format you want and you know you're going to use the same type again, uh, you can, and once you have your templates going, when you go back to your template again, I would title it however you want to do it. My computer doesn't like doing this right now. It's going to fail every time. Sorry, guys. Oh, it's all right. Maybe that's a good uh, segue. Um, <laughs> that was brilliant. Thank you. And uh, I want to give folks a chance to ask questions or comments. So yeah, so if you guys have anything you've run into, I probably figured out a hack around it. So please let me know if you want me to show you something. So do me a favor, raise your Zoom hand if you like, because that'll be a little easier for me to see if you want to question or comment. And I want to make sure you're all paying attention to the chat box as well. So Libby? That was great. Thank you so much. We're actually struggling using Publisher to do our annual one pages that look very similar to that. And um, I think that one of the benefits might be that you can do the charts when you're in PowerPoint, where I don't know if Publisher has that capability or if it has, we've not listened. We've always just opened up Excel, created the graphics, stripped them like you have, and either done like a snag it or, you know, just tried to, it, and then manipulate it, but then we couldn't ungroup it. And um, David uh, Britt on our team has worked um, to create these one pages and they're extremely tedious. So this, we had thought about moving it to PowerPoint and now I'm thinking it might be worth the, the juice might be worth the squeeze because it looks like it's a, easier to use than publisher. What are your thoughts about PowerPoint versus publisher to create something like this? Yes, I definitely like PowerPoint more. I think it's a little less clunky than Publisher. I think they've taken like more time to put in updates on um, PowerPoint than Publisher just because it's a little more used. Um, so yeah, I definitely, I think it probably has a lot of the same functionality. I just think it's a little easier and we're all a little more familiar with PowerPoint. So I, I don't hardly ever use Publisher anymore. Great, thank you. And uh, Ashley, you made your hand up. Yeah. Hey, Amy, thank you for that. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, you probably can't show us now, um, but I was wondering, and you may have said this and I missed it, and I apologize if that's the case, but um, how did you decide what size or dimensions to make your slides? Um, and is this like something that would be printed out on paper? I was just curious about if you had any sort of deciding factor in how to adjust the height and width. Yeah, we just did a paper size, so typical A511, so that we can very easily print it out and do it as a handout. Um, and then we've also, these have worked really well because they're fairly simple, like, you know, 100 feet off the ground level of data. So it's pretty good for um, like Facebook and Instagram snippets too. So we've been giving them to hospitals to just share the quick facts that they found in their assessments. Nice. Thank you. Great extra tip there. Uh, Brenna. Do you say, do they save pretty well as PDF? Is that the file format that you save them in? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They, okay. they export perfectly to PDF. Awesome. Um, and then I just also in PowerPoint, one nice thing is I hate the smart art in PowerPoint, but I love it if you break it up and it, so you can ungroup it and break it all up and then like retain some of the cool shapes that aren't in the regular shape feature of shapes in PowerPoint. And they're really easy to manipulate then in PowerPoint. So smart art, boo, but breaking apart smart art and making it something else, yay. And there's like a the flow charts cool, and stuff. Definitely. And like the new version of PowerPoint has a lot of really cool design ideas. Like there's this new tool and so I've taken a lot of like, it's all these cool graphic design kind of like snippets and you can just steal it and kind of move it around how you want it to go. Um, Cause I'm not really good at thinking things visually appealing but you should definitely check out the, the new design ideas tab because it will show you how to add all these elements. Great tips. Last call before we move on to mapping hacks. All right. Oh, uh, Lima? Uh, yes, I wanted to share one thing that when I move the um, boxes in PowerPoint, 
And sometimes they, you know, they just move just a little bit too much or just a little bit, you know, just too low or too, too high. I increase the whole size of the document. Just go to, to like 200 or 300. And then it, it moves the boxes a little bit. Uh, it's a little tip, moves the box a little bit smaller amounts. It's better to adjust. Nice. Great tip there. So Amy, thank you so much for doing that. That rocked. Um, that's awesome. And uh, now on to Penny for Map Hacks. Yeah, and Amy, real quick, several people expressed interest in your waffle chart template. So if you wouldn't mind sharing it, that would be fantastic. Um, so uh, several weeks ago, we solicited ideas for the data summit and information and topics that people were interested in hearing about. And um, one that came up multiple times was um, basically <laughs> simple mapping options, which um, as a lifelong GIS analyst makes me cringe because um, everyone shouldn't be out there making maps. But, but the reality is that people like maps and we all wanna be able to sometimes just create a quick map for, um, a, um, for a document, for you know, a, a application, grant application, um, maybe a little, map for a fact sheet, things like that. So we're not talking big publishable, you know, full page maps, but um, there seemed to be a lot of interest in folks um, hearing about um, kind of how they can create some quick maps. So I thought I'd show you a couple of tricks um, that I need um, Mandy and Chad and anyone else who uh, uses ArcGIS to shut their ears off and just let me do this. Um, and uh, and they're, they're in PowerPoint, actually. So today's about all about PowerPoint um, tips and tricks and hacks. So I'm going to share my screen. And there. And PowerPoint. Are you seeing my PowerPoint uh, presentation? Yep, okay, cool. We also okay. saw your teams. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I should hide that. <laughs> They're all my private conversations though. Um, so actually, let me shrink that just in case that happens. Um, so, okay, so uh, a couple of tips. One, I discovered just this morning that you can actually create a map from within uh, PowerPoint. And so there's two really big broad categories of maps, right? You've got the thematic map, which are the filled maps where like, if you're looking at the US, each state um, might be colored according to the value of some measure, you know, um, uh, or all states that are represented at the data summit would be a good example. So, so a filled map. And then the other type is the reference map, maybe a, a map of um, locations, right? So um, the, the only kind of map that you can create within PowerPoint is the filled map, but it's still kind of cool. So again, this is Office or um, yeah, Office 365 version. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily Intuito, right? So I'm gonna go new slide. I'm gonna change the layout to blank just because that's my preference. I'm gonna go to insert chart, oddly enough. And then hidden here, about halfway down is map. Like you can see, there's only really one option at this point. And what opens is a, um, a, a map of the world with kind of a default spreadsheet with some values. And then these values uh, correspond to the um, intensity of the color. So uh, let's say we wanted to do a state map maybe of um, states at the data summit. I could start um, typing these in and you just got to give it a second to catch up. And at one point I might get a, um, a, me a message, but just keep plugging away. There we go. I got my little like, you need geographical data. I know I'm getting there. I'm, I'm typing it in. Uh, I'm going off memory, so I apologize if I'm not going to put everybody. Uh, Nebraska and 
New Hampshire. And so you can see that the map uh, adjusted to the spreadsheet to zoom in just on the United States. And it created uh, a filled map based on these values. So I could, I could, change, uh, I could change the values. Um, then you'll need to do a little exploring, but there are options for changing the color palette and, uh, and different settings. But kind of a cool trick I didn't know existed um, to create a pretty decent um, field map. It also works for uh, counties. So I, I won't show you that. It's the same concept. Start typing in your counties. Um, it supposedly also works for cities and zip codes. So I did test it this morning on zip codes, um, but I started with a list of East Coast zip codes, which start with a zero. It didn't like that. So I don't know the workaround for that. You would need to um, look into that if you're interested. But uh, Wisconsin zip codes, it worked very nicely. So um, uh, yeah, so kind of a cool thing. John, just so you know, while I'm sharing my screen, I can't see chat or raised hands. So if you could monitor and let me know if I need to respond to anything, that'd be great. There's generally a lot of excitement. Uh, okay. Just about counties, you answered the question. Game changer, super cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, so, so that's the first kind of quick map trick uh, that I learned. The second is um, actually um, finding a map, let's say online. Okay. So this might do the same thing that Amy experienced. Um, not sure where that little PowerPoint thing went because I want to do it. All right. Nope. Okay, uh, the second thing involves um, basically uh, finding a map, a base map, maybe online. Um, the, the critical factor is that it must be a SVG file format. Um, and so uh, two quick tips with Pixabay, Pixabay, I believe website, you can actually, you have a download option of SVG and the, um, if you're searching on Google, you can do an advanced search and actually um, search by file type or file format. So you can search by SVG. I'm not giving recommendations on doing that. You need to look into licenses and everything. But uh, basically, so I, I found one online. I saved it to my share drive. I think y'all probably know how to Google, so I'm not going to uh, walk, walk you through that. Um, but you're gonna enter the picture just like you normally would. Um, so I did USA. Um, I'm going to resize it because I'm going to want a bigger map than this. And uh, you'll see that when I when I select the image, this new uh, tab, if you will, opens called graphics format. Um, and you'll see the selection pane. And Amy actually pointed that out when she was talking. So it's, it's in different places, but for this particular uh, function, we're gonna select it from the graphics pane. And what that does is opens up a side panel with your layers, if you will. Right now, we only have one layer because there's one image file. And then we're gonna go to this really handy convert to shape tool. So I click it and now you'll see, oh my gosh, there's all these things. That's because it has broken up uh, every essential polygon into its own uh, its own item. So now if I wanted to select Nevada, uh, I could do that. I can go to shape fill and I can I can do it that way. Um, you can also ungroup this. So I you know you'll notice I had a little trouble selecting the individual state. You can ungroup. Um, I would caution against that just because um, it, it, it could get a little dangerous. Like I, then I can start moving states all around and resizing them. And uh, it, then it's going to be hard to put your map back together. So ungroup with caution. And there's always the undo button, which is the best. Um, but essentially, yeah, so for a pretty simple, basic field map, uh, yes, there's manual entry. Uh, you know, where you'd have to select the states that you want. Um, but, you know, 
it's not terrible. So then you do, you do your fill. Orange. And there you go. So the, the critical kind of factor here is that it's an SVG file. So my next, after I learned this, I went online and tried to find any mapping software out there where you can, you know, upload your addresses and it puts the pins on it, just like Google's My Maps or, I mean, there's, there's a lot of online free mapping options, uh, but there's usually a, a steep learning curve. And the real, and the more simple ones don't export to SVG unless you have a paid, the, the, the few that I found, you had to have a paid subscription to be able to actually do that. So, um, so if you're looking to make a, um, a, a location map, if you will, um, the good news is at least this morning when I tested it, um, I created, I went to UDS Mapper, which um, is everybody, is everyone familiar with UDS Mapper? I'm looking at your little faces now. Yeah, guessing. All right. So in UDS Mapper, you can upload your addresses and it will pin them on the map. Uh, again, the, the only export option is a JPEG, but I found a free converter online, JPEG to SVG, and was able to insert the um, image and do the same thing that I just showed you. So that way, let's say you, you know, UDS Mapper, their default's a little square box with a marker, um, but you want to put, you know, a little hospital icon instead. That's where you can import that image into PowerPoint and um, make modifications there. So, Penny, a couple questions from the chat. Yep. Or, or I guess comments. One was uh, Sebastian wondering if there's uh, perhaps map templates in PowerPoint that would be available online. So there are um, vendors that sell editable maps uh, for PowerPoint, um, but they're for purchase. And I did not explore that to know kind of how far they break down, like if you're looking for census tracts or cities or zip codes or whatnot. Um, I don't know that that's, um, I, I don't know what the availability is, but everything I found for was paid. Um, okay, and uh, thank you. And also Danielle uh, says that uh, it looks like in her 2016 version of PowerPoint is not available. So this is probably confined to one of the more recent versions. That could very well be. Um, if you if the making a map option isn't available yet in the in the version that you have, still try looking for that uh, convert to shape option. Um, so that if you did find something online that you could import, uh, that might might still be an option in the newer one. Um, but let's say you don't, so this is kind of where I'm going to turn it over and, and I'm going to share links to kind of all the tutorials that I found uh, to help me do the demo. Uh, so I will share those with you guys uh, in case you're interested. They're quick little, you know, YouTube videos. Um, but this is kind of where I wanted to turn it over to you guys and say, how you, when you need a quick map, what kind of tools do you use? Um, what, what resources have you found? And we, Penny and I talked earlier um, because, you know, the term quick map kind of makes her cringe. Um, uh, the idea that some of us are grant writers and we don't necessarily want a full blown GIS map. We just want to display, you know, sort of illustrate one point. So is there a way to uh, create something relatively quickly and um, maybe for a figure versus a full page PDF on a report? You know, I will say that um, it seems that uh, many of you don't have access to Tableau or um, don't have the time um, to learn it or don't have the staff. Um, but something like this, just as John was saying, something quick and just trying to make one point for a grant or one pager um, is so simple to do in Tableau that if you know anyone in your office or even, you know, somebody in a stakeholder um, that you work closely with or within the university or whatever it is that does have that deals with Tableau. It's so simple that honestly, I would send them like the zip codes or the county and it can be done in, in minutes. So um, yeah, and then they can export that as, um, you know, an image and just send it to you. So I, if that's an option at all. Great, thank you. Good points. Um, comments or questions about that? 
Do you have any, you know, ArcGIS hate or even attempting this? Brenna? Others have probably mentioned it, but you can make, you know, like your personal maps in Google Maps, right? So with key locations and then just save it and export that. I've done that quickly for people. And then I've also used the UDS mapper. Um, I've never been able to get the upload GA code, geocode to work, um, but I had such a small number of addresses that I just plunked them in. Um, so I've used that because that's good for grants because it, you know, there, if you don't have, if you don't have a file that has all the facilities that you need to include, plus your key locations, right, you can just add on the layers and then add them in. So I've done that for maps with um, like limited number of location interest points. Um, and then for like graphics, I use, I've used the state face font for Arizona. And yeah. Like it's not really a map, it's a visual representation of Arizona, but I've just used the state face font and then added in two location dots, like for the medical schools, cause there's only two. So using the icon like location map thing. So that's like a really silly, but state face font is kind of awesome. Yeah, Ann taught us about that last year or the year before, and I have used it multiple times. It's, it's so fantastic. It's state face, and it's a free download font uh, from the interwebs. And I wanted to say, too, Penny and I were talking about this earlier, and, and sort of to Julie uh, Molina's comment in New Mexico from yesterday, uh, the idea that they may not have either the software Tableau or the staff to learn Tableau, even if they got it for free. Um, and we were wondering, you know, many of you in state, uh, state offices, it may not be in your particular group that you have a GIS mapper, but there has to be in Department of Health, you know, up on that third floor or something somewhere, you've got, there's somebody who is a GIS mapper. And so the question is not, can they do every map you ever want? but could they do a base map for you? In other words, you just sort of set the parameters. So it's a one-time ask. You go to them and say, look, I just need New Mexico and the counties and some, you know, kind of a handful of cities and maybe some uh, main roads. And then they just save that and have them save it as a vector file in addition to an image file. So an image file would be like a JPEG or a ping. That's something you'd modify in a Photoshop. A vector file is math and you can expand it or make it smaller and it won't change the resolution as an SVG, illustrator file, EPS, etc. So have them do that once. Um, and then you've got that map to work off of. And then like Penny said, if that's something you would import into PowerPoint, because you probably have PowerPoint, if I hopefully maybe the most recent version, um, then you could turn that into uh, uh, the thing she was talking about second. So there's an option. And then finally the Third thing I'd say is um, you might consider the list as um, Natalie was already scrounging uh, uh, with her, uh, Danielle, just to say, hey, is that, are you offering? Um, so you might turn out to the, to this list in general, the email list and say, hey, does anybody have, you know, a little spare time? Um, this is a very generous and smart group. So somebody might be able to create that base map for you if uh, uh, your colleagues are not feeling that love. Um, Mandy, I'm responding to her, mentioned that they have a library of shapefiles. Uh, and a shapefile is what you use to create a map, right? It's the polygons or it's the, the layers of, um, of information that go on the map uh, that we have in PowerPoint that individuals can use on their own for simple requests like grants or basic maps for presentations. So Mandy, I was just about to write back and say, should people reach out to you if they're interested in that or what? Who, how, and what would someone get a hold of kind of the inventory, what's available, and how to get access to those? Maybe your personal cell. Yeah. Uh, well, at this point, I think everyone has that. So if anyone on here doesn't, let me know. Uh, <coughs> sorry, it rings all the time. It's annoying. Uh, right now, it's mostly North Dakota specific. Uh, we do have some U.S. maps, though. Um, and what we've done is we have converted them to vectors. So they're in uh, PowerPoint in the way that actually Penny explained. So. Uh, they're clickable, you can color them in. Um, they export relatively nicely uh, and they fit pretty seamlessly both into presentations as well as um, kind of just like tucking them into grants. Um, so we are wrapping up a very large report right now, uh, but I can say that probably over the, let's say by the end of this year, I could probably have a little bit more robust of a library built. And what we do is we have um, a couple of OneDrive um, folders set out that are uh, 
limited access, but when people make requests, we give them access to it so they can go out and get things as needed. Um, and so that's something that we could do. A majority of those uh, initial layers do come from the Census Bureau. Um, so you just need to cite the Census Bureau as the source. So we're not stealing anything from anyone. Uh, we're just repurposing. Um, so that's something we could definitely make available. That's fantastic. And that reminds me that another thing uh, John and I talked about was uh, the listserv that um, most, if you've been to a previous data summit, you're already on. Um, if this is your first one, you'll get added unless you tell me not to add you um, to the listserv. Um, but yeah, if you have a request, um, your GIS, you don't have a GIS analyst for some crazy reason or they can't make a map for you, um, maybe put out the request to the to the group, again, for the base map, for the, like what Mandy was just talking about. So not making necessarily the finished map for you, but um, at least the editable file, um, put it out to listserv and see if, if somebody there can, can help you out with that. That's what we're here. We're a community. We want to help each other. So, uh, and yeah, I, I, would, I, I know oh. for, uh, I know for New Mexico, yeah, it's definitely, you know, kind of a homegrown shop for all of those things, you know, and, and I know for me, what I use for it specifically is I help to coordinate our J-1 visa program. Um, and every year, you know, we keep getting questions of where are they, what county, um, you know, and it's good to know that there's even a, a capability to drill deeper because, um, yeah, I, I want to be able to have a quick snapshot of even, um, you know, sort of what's what specific section of the county, you know, and I, I know for our state, it varies a lot, you know, Albuquerque's in Bernalillo County, and it varies, you know, from the east side of the county to the west side of the county. So yeah, I think that's awesome that, that there's that capability. So I don't know, you, you may, you might be hearing from us soon then to, to get some of those resources kicked off for us. Fantastic. And there was a male voice talking. Oh, it was me. I, I was going to say that uh, my background, I mean, my bachelor's degree is in cartography, so I've been doing this for a long time. Now, I've made more bad maps than I've made good maps, uh, as I told my students last night. Um, but I'm more than happy to look at any, if, help any way that I can, or if you need a critical eye uh, uh, looking at your maps. You know, one thing I would mention is, you know, for example, like when you do a choropleth map, the shaded map, like Penny was showing, you know, typically those maps, you always do rates, ratios, or proportions. You don't ever map total values. And there's little things like that that people, a lot of people don't think of uh, that can really impact the message and story that you're trying to tell. So um, I'm glad to be part of this group, and I'm more than happy to uh, uh, lend a critical eye or any kind of the, my limited expertise that I have. I love that. And that reminds me, I did do a um, mapping presentation last year or the year before. The years blend. Time means nothing anymore. Um, but I did do a mapping presentation that covered kind of some tips like that of how you're representing your data. Um, yeah. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll find a link to that and put it in the chat box just in case anybody's interested in either refreshing or looking through that for the first time. But that's a great point, Chad. Well, welcome to the community. We're so glad you're here. Yeah, I mean, I think too, I mean, especially with the COVID stuff, there are more bad maps floating around right now than there probably has been in a long time. And, uh, you know, I think we try to copy what other folks have done. And, and uh, uh, you know, um, again, I'm just as guilty of it as anybody else. But uh, uh, it can be a real game changer, a difference maker, uh, if you can, you know, just have uh, that one last pass through with somebody looking at can make a difference. Yeah, just a quick follow up on your point about the chloropleth and doing rates and ratios versus absolute numbers. I've seen a lot of those that will use like divided into quartile, you know, the raw numbers into quartiles. Um, and so what's the thinking behind that, that that's not as good as a percentage for that map type? Well, it's just the fact that the enumeration units or the counties or whatever unit you're aggregating the data in, they're all different sizes. So the actual size of the enumeration unit can, can uh, influence the amount of data that's collected or reported in that particular uh, unit. Um, so that's why you try to normalize that data or convert it to a rate or ratio. So rather than the you know, number of COVID cases total, it's COVID cases per capita uh, to minimize that influence of geography. I see, I get it. Gotcha, that's great, thank you. 
Uh, any other comments or questions? And maybe raise your Zoom hand. All right. Well, that's super awesome. Uh, Penny and I were chatting about it, which you may have seen flash up briefly, that uh, it would be fun for us to sort of cut out those sections of the, the recording and put them up as separate um, modules or materials for you all. Uh, so that if you wanted to go back and see all the cool things Amy was doing or Penny was doing, uh, you could just watch that particular video section. So we'll work on that. Oh, another thought we had, by the way, those of you that, um, oh, this was something, uh, speaking of Chad, you know, you'd made a comment about R, um, wait, no, you made a comment about uh, Python and your experience Python. with that. And John was saying, don't forget about R. Um, and, you know, something that might be kind of fun, at least for us to watch, not necessarily maybe for you to do, would be if you wanted to do a little narrated thing, we could hook it up over Zoom or whatever, just off the cuff, say, take, here's 15 minutes of using Python to clean data or using R. If you ever, and I know it's, it's, it's only a tiny snapshot, but at least it would give somebody a peek at it to be like, oh no, <laughs> that, is, that is over my head. Or yeah, yeah, I think I could do that. You know, just a taste, so to speak. Maybe we, we have members in this and attendees who have a ton of skills and someone, you all will have made comments about, oh, you can just do this. We thought, how cool to sort of pull that aside and maybe do a little, a little um, introduction. Uh, on a video and again we could just post it yeah um and i was going to say funny enough i also recently discovered that you can uh create videos of yourself doing a presentation in powerpoint yet another thing powerpoint can do who knew so there you go Many you can also add add closed captioning powerpoint will do that too oh very nice that's awesome. All right. Yeah, those, are, those are excellent suggestions, I think, too, as far as, you know, a lot of times we do have these simple maps that we need. So sometimes going into the more complex, uh, that's great. I also like your idea, too, of saying, you know, if people have other suggestions like Python, how to go through that. That's a, that's a great way to kind of explore that and say, do I need to delve into that further? Um, I know when, for instance, you know, I was super excited about Tableau, uh, but then having a challenge with our agency of being able to go ahead and keep the software updated was, uh, was a problem. So I think, you know, we all have our, our little limitations, but it, it's great for all of us to be able to share these workarounds and, and finding out what does work. So thanks. Absolutely. And John? Yeah, I had, I had uh, I, and I am totally an R zealot. Um, Python is great, don't get me wrong. It's just, I was raised with R and like was mentioned yesterday, there's like an online feud between R and Python users. I was just kind of teasing when I mentioned it. But in my previous uh, life, career, whatever, um, I was at the University of North Texas and I worked with a group of research and statistical consultants, and I had to put up a tutorial web page for uh, using SPSS, SAS, and R. And you know, the first two I kind of learned along the way as I was going through undergraduate and graduate school, and then I came across R. And of course, the other two are expensive. R is free, like the air you breathe. And so the tutorial page I created for R is quite extensive, including really important things like how to make it simulate blackjack and you know stuff like that. Uh, and I put in the the chat here the link to that old uh, website that I maintained. It's still up even though I've left. They didn't want to recreate it themselves, so they left my content up there. So you can, if anybody's interested in R, you can check that out. That sounds great. Thanks for that offer, John. Free is in beer. Um, and so uh, uh, it's uh, 16 minutes past, so um, it's probably time to shift to another break. Maybe if we take a brief break, let all that knowledge sort in for 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and uh, do our last discussion. 
we'll come back and finish it up. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>